Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. So I am going to tell you a little bit about options for home HIV SDI testing. Probably many of you have incorporated some of this into your world in the last few months. My typical disclosures is that I attended a Gilead meeting in 2018. We have a limited number of drugs. Really, um, I didn't change my disclosure for this, but my biggest disclosure for this talk is that we're going to talk a lot about industry, and I'm going to use brand names, and I apologize for that. They're just a limited number of um, companies that are in this world, uh, and it is what it is. So I'm going to give you a case. So 23-year-old male prep patient calls your clinic in midst of the COVID epidemic in April of 2020 because he took a home HIV test and it was reactive. So in the last year, he reports condomless receptive anal sex with 30 partners, most recently two weeks ago. He had an episode of secondary syphilis six months ago and was treated appropriately with IM penicillin, and he reports occasional alcohol, but no injection drug use or other substance use. In terms of his prep, he's been on daily prep for three years. He's been great about coming in regularly for his quarterly visits in labs. He was last seen um, in March, just before this all happened and he reports close to 100% adherence, and he says, you know, I missed a dose about uh, New Year's Eve and forgot to take it, but he denies any other past medical history or medications. So 23-year-old prep patient, pretty adherent, or at least reportedly adherent, and uh, in the midst of the COVID epidemic says he took a home HIV test. That was reactive. So which of the following is your interpretation? There's a poll, you get to vote, and it's, I'll tell you in advance, it's a little bit of a cheater question. Um, so use your best sort of judgment for which we do next. First interpretation, next step, tell him it was a false positive test and recommend he come in for his regular appointment in two months. Tell him to stop his prep and recommend he buy another self-test kit for confirmation. Reassure him it was likely a false positive test and recommend that he come into the clinic in the middle of the COVID epidemic for laboratory-based HIV testing or for prescribe a third drug as HIV antiretroviral therapy and plan to have him return to clinic in July when the COVID pandemic is over. Most of you chose that it was a likely false positive test. I think what I wanted you all to think about was one, what was that test? And we'll talk about all the different possible tests um, because the interpretation of that will really depend on what test that was. I wanted you all to sort of have the impression that he was likely uh, highly adherent to his PrEP, and therefore any test that was reactive had a very high likelihood of being a false positive. Um, And then thinking about what all of us have done and would do in a time when we want to keep people at home and out of the clinic, unless it's critical. Many of you have gotten this. We talked about sharing this um, guidance that came out from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC about a month ago now, despite um, my sharing my practice that we were basically just having people stay at home who were regularly adherent. So my practice has been and still is that if someone is doing well, that I'm not requiring people to come in for quarterly testing just because of the challenges of having people come in. But the uh, guidance from the CDC, which of course is not binding, is that quarterly testing should be continued for patient safety with lab-only visits, meaning no provider communication. But when lab-only visits are not available or feasible, CDC recommends considering two additional options. The first that they recommend is a home specimen collection kit, which is covered by most insurance plans and can be ordered by clinicians. Some laboratories, such as molecular testing labs, which they specifically call out, have validated protocols, with the alternative being an oral swab-based test. And they comment that although this type of self-test is usually not recommended for PrEP patients due to its lower sensitivity in detecting recent infection, as well as sort of its failure to detect some of the PrEP failures, uh, clinicians should consider use of these tests when other options are not available. So this is the recommendation. So what we're going to talk about in the next 10 minutes or so is um, what home tests and home collection kits are available and some of the characteristics of them, how well self-collection works for HIV and STI testing, and then, of course, always comes back to the challenges of syphilis.
So this is a, a selection of the home test kits that are available. If you can see my pointer, what you have here in the upper left is the OraQuick in-home HIV test, FDA approved for uh, self-collection of oral fluids and self-testing of oral fluids. On the upper right is a snapshot from molecular testing labs. They have a variety of panels as well as uh, individual tests that you can order, including a basic prep and a full prep continuation panel. And then down here, these two are two of the commercially available tests. And I saw one more on Amazon. I was just looking on Amazon to see what's available. These tests have been here for a while and uh, people have pointed them out to me before um, and someone can purchase that without a doctor's, a doctor's order. And you can see that, you know, one of these tests costs someone $270 to order their HIV test. These tests work in a similar way as the molecular testing labs that um, they are specimen collection kits. They are sent to labs that have validated the testing on those specimens. And so they are approved, but you always have to be uh, careful when you're going on Amazon or recommending that people buy tests on Amazon because occasionally things pop up from other places. They are not FDA approved. And as we'll talk about later, they are not always accurate. I have the caveat here that um, some of these home collection kits may not be available in all states. They're all states in New England that looked like appeared to me when I was on Amazon for whatever reason, they either haven't been validated or there are regulations prohibiting this. But at least in all of the states that are covered in the Mountain West AETC that these are available to you. So molecular testing labs, um, again, the one called out specifically by the CDC, that basic prep panel has an HIV and a creatinine. The full prep continuation panel includes HIV, hep C, a syphilis EIA, creatinine, and three site collection for chlamydia and gonorrhea. You can see the prices that they charge to individuals or to insurance companies. It is in network for many, but not all common insurance plans. This one does require a physician's uh, signature, physician's order. And this is the lab that is used by NERCs across the country. Couple things about it. They do, um, they have as an offer a hep B surface antigen, but no other hep B testing because it hasn't been validated. And the challenge of home collection is that a syphilis EIA does not actually re reflex into an RPR titer. So if you have someone who has a history of syphilis or you're in a population where there is a high prevalence of past syphilis, syphilis testing is going to be a challenge. Again, we'll talk about this. Uh, the turnaround time for this lab is supposed to be two days from receipt of the dried blood spot at the lab. Um, patients do a dried blood spot collection for these tests. But the total duration from the physician ordering to the shipping going out, particularly during this time when shipping is a challenge, to the patient getting it, to their returning it back to the lab, presumably they do it quickly, and then results being available has been about three weeks. So this is not something that we can use for prep starts, and it would not be something that I would do for urgent lab follow-up. I don't know, we can talk later if folks have used this, but we have not embraced it at this point because of that duration of the turnaround time. So a little bit more details about some of these things. Um, the OraQuick in-home test, as we've talked about before, it's an oral fluid test in the phase three clinical trial where it was FDA approved. The sensitivity compared to a blood-based antibody test was only 92%. We know in practice that oral fluid has a lower sensitivity in early infection, even lower than this. Our estimates are that it's about 70 to 80% in a population of men of sex with men. The specificity is super high, but still leaves you room for having those false positive tests. And then, of course, we know and have presented that PrEP can lead to delayed seroconversion and false negative tests even up to two years, particularly with oral fluid tests. And those are data that were from Marcel Curlin and Deborah Dunnell from the Partners PrEP study. I wanted to look, you know, it's always curious to me, sort of the, you know, how well do people do at home? What you can see here, there was a really nice um, meta-analysis that I'm citing at the bottom that in general, People swab, do sw okay with swabs. This is um, some data that you can see looking at sensitivity of urine compared to provider collected cervical swabs and vag self collected vaginal swabs compared to provider collected cervical swabs. Provides the evidence for why, um, when we are doing for women, why we prefer vat self collected vaginal swabs over urine collection. But these are pretty good. They're not fabulous. So they're, when you are doing self-collected specimens, there is the room for false negatives. 
but specificity and all of these self-collection methods are very good and few false positives. This table is for chlamydia. This table is for gonorrhea. Again, the numbers look pretty similar. And the one thing I want to come at here, sorry, this I'm going back to the chlamydia, is that the first three comparisons were pooled sensitivity and specificity. The comparisons of rectal uh, for both men and women and pharyngeal swabs for men of sex with men are reflected in only uh, one or a very small number of studies. Same thing here for the rectal and the pharyngeal swabs. So small numbers, not pooled estimates, but they still look pretty comparable. How well do people do collecting their dried blood spots? We don't have a lot of data for this. We know that generally people can do it, but I've given you a few examples of HIV-related studies where people have done home dried blood spot collection. These are research studies, so people are trained and are given a fair amount of tested materials. ESTAMP was a project that was run out of CDC, out of Emory. And of the dry blood spot cards that were returned, about a quarter of them were bad quality. Uh, Sabina Hirschfeld did a project of um, just over 500 men of sex with men that were enrolled in a feasibility study of home viral load monitoring. These are our HIV positive folks. Of the 554, 439 attempted to collect a specimen. 418 of they reported that they attempted that. 418 actually mailed in a dried blood spot, and 337 of the folks who attempted to collect a dried blood spot had an adequate dried blood spot. So again, about three quarters able to do it well, one quarter not well. And a similar number from a study of, of Nether, uh, in the Netherlands of the feasibility of home, um, this is therapeutic drug monitoring, smaller number, 50 subjects collected 200 blood, dried blood spots, of which of the total of the dried blood spots, um, not quite 90% were suitable. And about two thirds reported that when they tried this for the first time that they were successful. So it can work, but it is not a solution for everyone. And then just finally wrapping up with syphilis. How good is home testing for syphilis? Well, when you compare it against the uh, treponemal and antibody tests, the sensitivity and the specificity are very good. They're over 90%. The challenge, of course, is that we don't have dried blood spot enabled non-treponemal tests. So again, we cannot tell whether there is a new infection or we can't monitor syphilis infection currently using um, FDA approved or validated tests. The other strategy that is being investigated, so this is a research study, is the PrEP at Home study that was run that is run out of Emory by Aaron Sigler that is looking at whether or not individuals can collect a dry blood spot, but also whether they can collect finger stick blood into a capillary, small capillary tube that that gets mailed in and sent for uh, syphilis. Uh, so this, they are able to do, again, it's a research project, they were able to do RPRs on it. And uh, what I wanted to show you in that figure on the right is how um, easy and acceptable it was for people to collect both the dried blood spots at the bottom and the collection in the micro microtube. And again, though most people can definitely do this, they can collect dry blood spots as we saw in those other research studies, and they can also collect the blood in the microtube. It is not perfect. And so there are other strategies that people are working on because again, as, um, we have a, a number of um, uh, syphilis cases in this population of individuals on PrEP. There is potentially a, a rising rate of syphilis in this population. And so getting, being able to do RPR titers, especially if we are home for the long haul is gonna be critical. My last two slides are about home tests that are not FDA approved. So I am showing you a slide of a screenshot of a STD test kit that is, I could actually buy this online and have it shipped to the US. I didn't do this, but there are companies that will do this despite the fact that they are not FDA approved and the FDA goes after them every once in a while. And what I wanted to show you is a project that looked, it's a fairly old project, but looked at the accuracy of home test kits. And it, about 10 years ago, they looked and could find uh, 27 US and ex-US sites that were offering uh, STI kits and service services. They tried to understand what the tests were and anything about sort of the validation and QC protocols. 
Only two sites actually returned surveys and reported a turnaround time of their results of one to seven days and, and being accredited. But again, two of 27 is really not enough to comment on. They were able to get test kits from six different sites. They had two kits uh, which they submitted specimens for, which they knew what obviously the chlamydia and gonorrhea, and this was a chlamydia and gonorrhea study, chlamydia and gonorrhea for, and those all turned correct. Uh, of note, one of them was from the, was a co-authors site. Uh, they got two self kits, self test kits, of course, not FDA approved. Both of them gave false negative results. And then they sent two kits to a site in the United Kingdom. They report in the manuscript that they were never able to get a result, uh, even with follow-up phone calls and emails and trying to communicate with the site. So sort of a caveat emptor, buyer beware with these home test kits. And if you are using them or encouraging your patients to use them, want to make sure that the ones you are using are FDA approved and you understand what the limitations are. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.